Disruptive Storytelling with Military Changemakers is a bi-weekly podcast presented by Partners in Promise. Partners in Promise is a nonprofit dedicated to protecting the rights of military children in special education. Large organizations like the military have learned to love the status quo. But at Partners in Promise, we believe in being disruptive as we have learned that having easy conversations rarely leads to real change in special education or in the military. We are storytellers who aren't afraid to get a little disruptive. Are you a military change maker who wants to hear more disruptive stories? Consider sponsoring an episode of Disruptive Storytelling, and together we can work to combat stigma within the military. For more information, email info at partnersinpromise.org and be sure to subscribe to the podcast. Welcome back to Disruptive Storytelling with Military Changemakers. I'm your host, Jennifer Barnhill, and today I am joined by two amazing military spouses, Callie Meredith and Sarah Curtis. Thanks for coming. Hello. This is the first podcast we've done where we're actually getting to chat with more than just one person. So I hope you're ready. (laughs) Yes. I am. I'm so happy you guys are here and talking with me today about stigma. I'd like to just kick it back over to you guys and to introduce yourselves, who you are within the military lifestyle, how long have you been a military spouse, and then we'll kind of jump into why we're here today. Sarah, would you like to go first? Absolutely. So I am Sarah Curtis. I am married to my husband, Chase. He's in the Air Force, and we have been part of this military lifestyle for almost two years now. And then before that, he was in the ROTC. And we met in school, got married. He commissioned into the Air Force, and now we're in Florida um, with our little baby boy. So yay. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining, Sarah. Kelly, your turn. Yeah. Hi, my name is Kelly, and I've been a Army military spouse for just over a year. We got married in the middle of the pandemic. What? (laughs) Yeah, it was so much fun. 10 out of 10 recommend to every single person. It was not stressful at all. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but I'm I'm also a podcaster, and and I've been doing a lot of male spouse related content, so I'm I'm super stoked to, to be talking about this with you today. Yeah. And I actually was a guest on Kelly's podcast. You were. It was a wonderful experience and I highly recommend we'll put information for all of the stuff you're into in the show notes, of course. But one of the reasons that I was talking with you was about the reason we're here today, partially in your Dependa Who series, we talked about stigma and stigma with EFMP. And that's why we're here, we're here today. But what we're going to talk about today is a little bit different. And I know we're going to talk about the Dependa Who series and get your feedback on that. But we want to talk about the stigmas that are associated with just being a military spouse, being a dependa. That is for those who don't know the word, can you guys, can someone jump in and say, give me a a definition? What do you think a definition in your mind of dependa is? Yeah. So I've been really looking into this because like you said, I've been doing a whole series on dependa and a dependa is basically a very derogatory term to use towards a military spouse who it's meant to depict a spouse who uses her husband's rank or, or his spouse's rank kind of like a quote unquote Karen of the military spouse world, just really rude. Um, Yeah. So it's just, it's not a very nice term. It's sort of used to label military spouses as weak and dependent upon their spouse or service member for any and everything. Yeah. It's definitely not a a warm, fuzzy expression. (laughs) No, not, not really. (laughs) Yeah. No. No. And, and so um, we wanted to kind of get a little bit of a background. So, so Stigma, it's essentially this idea that you are labeled with some kind of characteristic, whether it's true of you or not. And that obviously is true uh, for military spouses who are facing this label of dependa. They maybe have absolutely no idea what it means to wear rank or to behave in this way. They know how to avoid being a Karen in life, but maybe not like, and I'm so sorry for all the Karens out there. Like, this is hard. I'm so, it's such a hard situation for you. (laughs) 
forgive me, uh, but you know what I'm saying. So we know that it's hard to anticipate a consequence. So we don't want our, our, you know, fellow military spouses to kind of go through this. So we kind of want to address some of the examples of being labeled a Dependa. You know, I, I'd, lo- I'd love to hear what you all have to say, because I've, I've been a Navy spouse for 15 years. So I have a, a lot of experience on this, but I, I would hope that my experiences wouldn't be as bad as maybe what you're experiencing. But based on our previous conversations, that might not be true. Sarah, do you want to share any, any of your stories about what you've experienced as being labeled a Dependa? Yeah, absolutely. So a majority of what I've experienced has been through Instagram specifically, especially because of COVID. Really, we haven't had much interaction with other military members. That's just how it is right now, especially as a spouse and living off base. But I first was introduced to this word maybe like three months into starting like my Instagram thing. And somebody called me a dependent and I was like, I have no idea what this means. So I looked it up on like on Google and I was like, what is a dependent? And it exactly what Callie said, like very derogatory. And somebody called me that in a comment and I was like, okay, what? (laughs) Like, this is not me. This is, I cannot even believe this is a thing in the first place, but yeah, a majority of it has been on Instagram where it's whether it's like somebody directly coming at me like man this makes you a dependa like you staying home and taking care of your child and using tricare that makes you a dependa and I was like no <laughs> that's not I mean sure it makes me a dependent but the way you're using the term is not not true so if you're posting something on there like can you give some more examples of like the posts that you're talking about that might, what are some things that you might avoid posting just to avoid being called a dependa? I feel like there's a strong pull for me to like prove myself. Like I have a business and I do all these things. I'm not just, you know, which then there's nothing wrong with it, but I'm not just sitting at home doing the dishes and doing the laundry and like all of these things that a typical like housewife would do, which again, nothing wrong with that. But I feel like I need to prove myself for some weird messed up reason of like, oh yeah, I, I, for example, the, the comment that I got initially was like, I wrote a blog post about like rules that you need to know as a military spouse, um, like things like uniform rules were like, you know, no, like excessive, like kissing or whatever. They just have rules that you just need to know about. And somebody was like, oh yeah, like, Imagine having to, I I could never be a military spouse because I could never follow rules that my husband has to follow. And I was like, I don't, it like doesn't bug me that much, but things like that, where it's like, you know, part of being a military spouse is, you know, following OPSEC, like knowing what to post and what not to post. And so there are things that come with the lifestyle that some people might be like, well, that's too demanding. Or like some people just see it as like, when you are a spouse of a military member, the military rules your life, which in some ways is unfortunately true, but you are still your own person. And so I feel like a huge pull to like prove myself to be like, yeah, I've got business that I'm running. I'm not, you know, like the typical dependa that people use. Yeah. Not just a spouse. Yeah. Not just a spouse, just, uh, not just a spouse. And I use air quotes there. It, just a spouse is it's another variation, I think sometimes of Dependa. (laughs) You're, oh, you're just a spouse. Oh, you're just a spouse. And can I ask, and then uh, we'll get to your story, Kelly, who do you think is posting this? Do you think it's service members, trolls, other Dependas, so to speak, or fellow military spouses? Who's using the, like this word more often than not? So I've seen it in a couple ways. I've seen it one as service members who have been hurt by a spouse where it's like, bad relationship or they were used by somebody just like to receive benefits, which unfortunately, I mean, it happens. I've never seen it, but I'm sure it happens, but things like that. So people who have been hurt by somebody who's done that or feel like they've been used by a spouse. So like service members. And then I've also seen it where it's like somebody who has literally no idea about the military, no military background, nobody in the military. And they're just like, man, why would you feed off of your spouse like that? And I'm like, Because we're a team, because we're a partnership. That's how it's supposed to work. But so things like that. I've also seen it 
unfortunately, from other spouses who say, I've been in the military for 20 years and I'm not re this reliant on my spouse's career. And I'm like, okay, well, that's your, you know, that's your experience. You don't have to live on base. You don't have to participate in all of the, like all of the things that are offered to you, whether that's resources or whatever. But that's how I'm choosing to experience this. And this is my life. This is my decision. So those main three groups is where I see it the most. Absolutely. And <laughs> the back in my day is also a very powerful <laughs> way of yes. uh, hurt, hurting or making a new spouse feel like they're doing it wrong. Kelly, what has your experience been with being either labeled a dependa and the stigma, the stigma of being a military spouse, really? What have you experienced? A little while back when my husband was still deployed, I had a reel that I made that went viral, a couple million views. And it was basically me talking about how being very candid about struggles of deployment, one of them being, you know, you miss certain things when your service member's gone, wanting to have, you know, one-on-one -on -one time with your spouse. And I, I made this funny video and I had so many negative comments, so many about, you know, your dependa and like, you're probably waiting for your Jody to come home, which is another kind of dependent related derogatory term. It's like someone that someone cheats on their spouse with, but it kind of all boiled down to just, you knew what you signed up for, like such a dependent to complain about things like your husband's risking his life and you, all you can do is complain about how you're not getting like him time or whatever. And just silly things like that. And I've gotten a couple like hate comments on other things too. Like obviously my show is all about new spouses and guiding new spouses. So I'll, I'll also, to, to Sarah's point, get the occasional disgruntled spouse who's been in for forever being like, you know, this is just how it is, like buck it up and, and get used to it kind of comments. But it was it was just one one thing that set it off that, you know, being open and candid about how things suck. I think the dependent term is used to sort of like trash people who talk about how hard it is to be a military spouse because of that whole you knew what you signed up for mentality which I always say you know in your vows you say like in sickness through else through better like whatever like you could say that to anybody it's not helpful it's it's the opposite of that it's completely just destructive but yeah and I think that was the first main sort of dependa stigma instance that I had and then as I sort of built my platform and started talking about other things and talking about specific aspects of military life that were hard, you know, deployment and PCSing and things, you get people chiming in. And, and usually there are trolls or people who have had very little military experience. A lot of times it would be, you know, someone with six followers, like small little, little troll accounts who have a very Either they know someone in the military or they did a small stint while in the military or they were burned by somebody in the military that they just have this nasty perspective of anybody associated. And it tends to get taken out on the dependas, mostly because I think we're an easy target. Yeah. Like we're chickens with our heads cut off running around half the time because we have no clue what's going on. And it makes us a very easy target for for being stereotyped and being hated towards. Yeah. And when we're talking about you know, saying things like you're like, we're, when's your Jody coming home or calling you a dependa or saying, you, you know, <laughs> you knew what you signed up for. First of all, that comment, it's, I wonder, I, I mean, do parents, I mean, not saying, if, I don't know if you all have children or not, but that is often said to parents. And, and unless that child that you have is like just out of the box, ready to, to go to college, you don't know what you signed up for. And, and it's yeah. just, an, it's so unfair. It is not the same. You might have some idea, just like anything, any new life choice that you make, you think, you know, and you might know step one, step two, but you have no idea. And, uh, and the military is very complex. So I'm so sorry that you all have gone through that. You know, I want to share from my, my side of the, this conversation, having been a spouse for 15 years, I have obviously, and I'm a military spouse reporter. So I get a lot of comments about anything that I write that's personal. If I, I write as a journalist, I often don't get that kind of feedback, but whenever I write something about my story, yeah, it's always personal and it's an attack and it, it feels combative. Meanwhile, I'm out there doing a lot of the things for free and trying to help 
potentially that person's family. (laughs) So it does come back at you. Um, The other areas that I think some maybe more senior military spouses have dealt with is that rank associated Mm -hmm. labels and perception. And so if you are an officer spouse, you might you, you might feel obligated from the officer side to do certain things, to be the hosts of the FRG or to, to show up and open your couch to the person who's having a hard time. You have that obligation on that side. And then you also feel like you can't really belong anywhere on the other side. You know, you can't, if you make good friends with someone who happens to be enlisted, who you're not actually in the military and yet you're not really supposed to be friends. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You have no responsibility there to follow the military rules in terms of, you know, there's no such thing as fraternization between spouses because you're not sharing secrets and you're not like the rank does not apply to you in any shape. Yeah, way or no. Form, and and so. I remember my, my one experience I had with being a dependa was a personal one. So I, my, I lived in Japan and so we, had to deal with picking up family from the airport. And it was a three hour trip to go to the airport. So it just so happens, my mother did not actually pay any attention to when the boat was coming back and decided to fly in the day that my husband was supposed to come home. So I was asking very innocently of the commanding officer spouse, hey, you know, what, do you know if they're doing any fly offs? Do you know, like any of that? Like what's happening? I just need to make some plans. That was interpreted as me trying to get my husband off the boat early and, you know, asking for a favor. And it wasn't my intent whatsoever, just trying to make plans. But, you know, automatically you get placed and labeled as a dependent and, and you didn't do anything. People rarely, when you get these labels and stigma are trying to understand you. <laughs> and so that's really hard. I know what we're talking about Kelly, you're, you did this whole series in your dependa who, did you find any patterns or like obviously we have these individual stories, but did you see any patterns of military spouses coming forward, telling you their stories and what solutions there might be, if any? Yeah. So it was very interesting. I talked to a lot of different, different spouses, you know, from, from all different walks of life. And cause the goal of the depend to who series was like, can we challenge and break the stereotypical view of who a military spouse is? I talk a lot in my podcast about like more than just a spouse. And so I wanted to see if we could break that. And one of the things that was kind of a theme throughout it was that these viewpoints of military spouses are so outdated. And the way in which spouses are viewed is outdated. It's still as if the military is kind of trapped in this 50s, 60s viewpoint of a typical military spouse in that, you know, they're meant to be in the background. You know, they're meant to be these you know, things that can just kind of support when they're needed and and be gone when they're not. And sort of, you know, their marriages are meant to be this very fragile thing and, and they're, they're meant to not explore careers and they're meant to stay home and, and et cetera, et cetera. And again, nothing wrong with staying home. I think it's, it's a job in itself. But the stay-at-home spouse of today, the stay-at-home male spouse of today is different than the stay-at-home male spouse of the 50s. And the, the structure and the responsibilities of military couples now is different than that in the 50s. And it was kind of talking to people this generalized frustration of we're so different and we're so unique and we bring so much to the table and we're not viewed in as unique and opportunistic and we have these awesome gifts that we can use. And so it was figuring out, you know, how do we pull this archaic description of what a military spouse is out of the past and how do we modernize it? And it was really kind of came down to like, hey, we need to be talking and like vocal about this and talking to different people and like, how are you being vocal about this? So that was, I think, a theme is that it's just, it's so outdated what a military spouse is. The definition of what a spouse's role looks like is so, it's not modernized to what we do now as spouses or what we can do now as spouses. Amen, sister. I will just (laughs) tell you. So I'm going to be really nerdy because I'm a nerd and I have a book called Camp Following and it's a history of the military wife. If anyone's interested, I'll put a link to this information in the show notes, but I want to, this is a quote from the Revolutionary War. (laughs) There's letters about how military spouses were described by service members. And I'm just going to read this quote. It said, Unlike the general's wives who usually traveled in some comfort, these women, and especially the laundresses, followed the army on foot. And the quote is, weighed down with 
heavy iron pots, small children and baggage. And then they also went on, which is fine. That's just normal quote. <laughs> and then it goes, their hair flying, their brows beady with heat, their belongings slung over their shoulders, chattering and yelling sluttish shrills as they went and spitting in the gutter. There has been a negative description of military spouses by service members since the Revolutionary War. So if we're going <laughs> to, so you're saying this is outdated, but it's historical, it's long term, this behavior and treating military spouses, undermining a negative experience in order to keep up a presentation of strength. And so I think what you're saying, Kelly, and I don't know about you, Sarah, is that talking about it is strength too. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I was, I'm going to agree with both of what you're saying, being out there and challenging the stigmas, not just, you know, like what both of you are doing, you know, noting this and then saying, okay, now this is how we change it. This is how we go about igniting change and encouraging others to not see it like this. Um, and instead to see the strength that military spouses have and the courage and like, for example, some people get bugged when like, you know, you show your military ID and somebody says, thank you for your service. And it's like, no, I'm not the service member. You know, I'm just the spouse, but like you are sacrificing a lot as a spouse. And so like even something as small as that, instead of like shooing away, you know, the thank you for your service comment, just be like, thank you. Like, I appreciate it because it is not like an easy task and you can ask any military spouse and like, mm -hmm. you know, it's you're dealing with deployments, you're dealing with unknown schedules and very last minute things. And you're dealing with all of the issues that come with TRICARE. And, but like, you know, at the same time, then there's also these, th these people that say depend on saying, oh, don't complain about that, you know? So yeah, it's both sides to the coin. And I think the whole point is to challenge the stigma and then talk about how to change. I love that you brought that up because my husband, we had a conversation a couple weeks ago because I brought him for the Dependa Who series to interview him about some different things. And he, the first time someone did that, thank you for your service. I was like, I'm not the service member. Like, don't thank me. I don't do anything. He, my husband like very kindly said, he's like, you don't wear the uniform, but you take care of, of a ton of stuff on the home front. He was like, you're not technically serving, but you serve in a different way. And he was like, you sacrifice in a different way. And he's like, so yes, like, does it feel uncomfortable? Yes. But you also, you do these things. You participate in a way that is you're providing a service. And I, I think, yeah, just fighting it and just being like, no, like you're going to call me. I want to reclaim Dependa as like a like stamp and be like, <laughs> yes, like I am a Dependa. <laughs> I do these things and that's okay. You can't see Callie, but she has her fist. She, she is like <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> Standing hard. I am, I am so prepared. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so the reason the Partners in Promise is even doing this podcast on stigma is to find solutions. So I, I and we are here, a lot of our family members have children. We have different experiences. We're at a certain point in our lives that things are a little different than maybe where you are. But it sounds like we're all having walked through the same path to get to where we maybe are today. And so what solutions, I'll give it to you since we started with you, Sarah, would you give us some solutions that you would have if you could either speak to leaders, what would you do that would be a change to help improve this? But also what would you say to your other military spouses and also service members? So those three categories, how, how would you look to, to improve it? And you don't have to hit all of them. If you only have one, that's fine. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> And you're good. I think probably the best way to find a solution is to go to the people that are having problems, to talk to the spouses that are struggling. I know the army has a program where if you have a problem with how something is being run in the area, you go to that organization and you say, hey, like we need a longer paternity leave. That's something that they've changed. Like they have implemented that change into it. And so I think if they can create an organization where it's like, Hey, this is, you know, and like, there may be some things where they literally cannot control, like, you know, dates of deployments and whatever, but things where it's like better communication or whatever it is, whatever you're struggling with to have a place where you can go and ask those questions, talk about change, talk about what the leadership can do and what is in their power, because they may just, I mean, they already have so much going on. They may not be thinking about like opening, like 
a forum on a website of like, this is what I'm struggling with. And this is a possible solution because then they're bringing the solutions to them. And it's like, oh, that would be cool. We could do this or we can't do that, but this is something we can do instead. So I think like either creating an organization or opening a forum on a website would be a great option, at least as a starting point. So absolutely. And, and key to that is follow back up with that comment. Yes. Feeling heard goes so far, I think, in this type of, touch, it, it is a touchy-feely concept. It's, it's this feeling. It's not necessarily, you know, overt discrimination of any kind. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's bullying involved, so that's a different thing. But yeah, following back up, that's a great suggestion. Just like even once, once that goes back to the leadership, having a military spouse on the panel or in the room or sitting down talking like to them when they read through the solutions of like, okay, yeah, like this, I agree with, or like this, not a lot of people deal with like some, somebody like you, Jen, where you've got a lot of experience talking to multiple military spouses and being in a lot of different areas where you, someone who has an open mind and is willing to listen and make change. So. And so I have a question. It, I know, I know a lot of senior leaders we've been told have listened to this podcast and just from a salty Navy spouse perspective, where as a younger military spouse, where would you want to receive this information? Where would you want to go and find the feedback? Where would you want to access it? Would it be like on social media platforms or on through the installation, through the command? Like where, where would you want to actually receive updates? What is the best place? Personally, for me, probably social media. Like I know I follow all the branches on social media and I can see all their updates. And so for me as a new spouse, that would be the best place for me because it would, I mean, I know a lot of spouses that in my position that never go on base and never have anything to do with that. So posting signs up, I don't think would do anything, but yeah, probably social media or some form of internet solution. Thanks. Confirming what the old people, myself, being old people. <laughs> um, we're, we're wondering. <laughs> Alrighty, Kelly, you're up next. Yeah. So I, first of all, love the idea of some kind of form just because like in my not line of work as an analyst, I deal with forms a lot and they are just so much more efficient than trying to pull people into a room and go, okay, let's talk because that goes a long way. But to get to an actual solution, you'd have documented like this is what needs to get done. And so some kind of form. But honestly, I wish we could just as a collective unit come together and do some sort of like definition planning. And so what that looks like in a business world, like when you're problem planning is you get into a room and you whiteboard out like what is our existing definition of what a military spouse is? What is our existing definition of the duties of a military spouse? And now what is the what are we doing today? What is the military spouse of today doing? I know when I came to, to Campbell, they do different, like, I just learned about this. We have an organization that actually helps spouses and like acclimate. And I had no clue, like the communication about information that's available for spouses is one outdated, but also two, like not communicated, like Sarah said, they need to be more present on social media to get attention from spouses. I don't know if you've, anyone has ever gone onto a military website, but they are the gosh darn hardest thing to maneuver, <laughs> like yeah. holy guacamole. They're so hard to maneuver. And also to that point about resources, there needs to be, especially if they are connected to the military, specific pointed resources for spouses. A lot of the career fairs and mill spouse events are very vague and they try and serve a very broad, again, outdated view of what a military spouse is. And it is someone who is just the cheerleader, which all spouses are cheerleaders, but they are not just spouses. They do things outside of military life. They do things outside of being just a wife, being just a mom, being just a partner. And there are certain events that take place that I think feed into this generalized idea of what a mill spouse is and what a mill spouse can do. And I think if they're going to put on events, they need to be communicating with that community of what are you looking for? What do you need? Not what do we as a military think you need and not as where do we as a military think you fit in? 
what specifically are you looking for? Where do you want to fit in? I know for me, when I was job searching, I utilized a military spouse job person. I have a degree in biomedical engineering. They sent me secretary work only, job openings. I, which there's nothing wrong with that, but it wasn't anything that I had asked for or needed from them, but they had assumed, you know, and I had sat in meetings with them and they said, oh, we see you're a military spouse. Here are these jobs for you. These are the ones that you're qualified for. And I said, did you look at my resume? No, but just because I was a military spouse, they sent me these types of jobs. There needs to be resources that are communicated that are specific, pointed and resourceful, not just I'm checking a box to say we help the military spouses because that's a lot of times I love how helpful they are, but a lot of times it feels like they're just checking a box to say that they, they covered us. Yeah. It's also, you know, important to note that the way that the government, the military, these, these business models are structured is very slow. And that is, Yes. Not, it's just a fact. Yes. It's not, it's not to throw anyone or any program under the bus. They're not mandated for innovation. They're mandated to continue on a status quo. And it's up to us as military families, military spouses to inform them when they're getting it right, when they're not, but it's not just, and, and here's the other thing, like Sarah, you mentioned having this feedback. Well, there are things like that. The ice comments are there. It's just a matter of actually doing something with them and to not and to categorize military spouses as being a relevant person, uh, you know, people of interest. So I think we have to understand the limitations that the DOD is under, but also we do need to actively, proactively share our stories. And so first of all, I thank you so much for sharing some of these, these encounters, because I think that you are exactly right. The model is outdated. Who they're looking to, to solve problems is outdated. And I'll be honest, I think it's because they look to people like me who have more experience, but it's up to me to look to you (laughs) and to look to younger people. And it it is ever evolving. We have to, but Dependa has been here a long time. So we need to work on that. The main thing is just to know who military spouses are to help remove that label and that stigma associated with being a Dependa because it's not reality for many spouses, both salty like myself and, you know, newer spouses Mm -hmm. like you guys. So thank you so much for joining. I'm going to kick it back over to you if you have anything else to add, but I really appreciate you sharing your stories and we'll definitely share some of your information, how they can connect with you in the show notes, but anything else to add ladies? No, I have, I have nothing on mine. I just, I, I'm totally with you. Like depend is so outdated. Let's squash it and let's get over this more than just perspective because every spouse is that they're more than a just. Yeah. And it, it undermines the contribution of military spouses and yes, everyone out there who is a military spouse know that you are appreciated. There are people who think of you and your contributions as very valuable. The military wouldn't be able to operate the way that it does with the secure home front if it wasn't for you. So thank you everyone. And if you are interested in sharing your disruptive story, feel free to email partners and promise at info at partners and promise.org. Thank you. Disruptive storytelling with military change makers is going on a short hiatus for the holiday season so that we can all take time to be with our families and come back again in early 2022 to start a new series. This series is called We Heart Data, But Stories Complete Us. We will bring on experts from other military service organizations and other agencies that are tasked with finding out more about military families and families who have exceptional needs. We will bring in those leaders so that they can tell us what stories the data is telling them so that we can help make change for our military family community. Looking forward to seeing you in 2022.